Welcome everyone. I'm Diane with EdWeb, and it's my honor to introduce our presentation today with the Congressional Medal of Honor Society. I'm here with Kathy Metcalf, Vice President of Education for the Society, and our honored guest, Medal of Honor recipient, Michael Thornton, who received the medal for his service in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War. And we're also joined by Ms. Hallman and her students from Highland Park High School, Middle School, I'm sorry, in Texas. Hi kids, thanks everyone for coming. Okay, uh, Kathy, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Great, thank you, Diane. It's good to be here. Thank you, Mike, for being here with us today. And thank you to the students both in the classroom today and those online. I want to welcome all the uh, other people who are watching today as well. I would point out that this is a program that is designed for students to have an opportunity to talk today with, with Mike about his experience and as part of our character development program to learn more about what values are part of the Medal of Honor. So please be aware, those of you watching online, that while we will get to as many questions as we can, we will take questions from students before we take both in the classroom and the questions that come in online before we take questions from the adults. So we want to really address students today. Thank you for that. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I think that the students in the, I know the students in this classroom have all watched Mike Thornton's Living History, and so they know the basic story of why he was awarded the Medal of Honor. And so we want to go ahead and get started with questions that you have. And um, one of the first is, is Ryder here today? Ryder is not here. Ryder first asked, when did you join the Navy? And I think what goes with that is, why did you join the Navy? <laughs> I joined the Navy in uh, actually 1966. And the, the funny thing was, uh, I had dyslexia real, real bad. And of course, now we understand what dyslexia is. But back in those days, I knew I was studying hard, but I didn't understand it. And I got in a lot of mischief, uh, as I call it. And uh, my father was a uh, contractor, and one of his good friends was a uh, the judge for juvenile delinquents. And they set up a deal for me. Uh, and he said, "Well, what are you? What I tell you, if you ever come back to my his his court, that I'd have to go to reform school." Or, and he said, I'm going to let you make your first major decision in life. And I said, what's that? He said, don't you turn around and look at one of these great. And back then, that's when they drafted. And I always wanted to be a Navy frogman. And I came to attention and saluted. And I said, I want to be a Navy frogman. And I joined the Navy. And later on, 20 years later, I found out my father and the judge rigged the whole thing <laughs> to get me in the military to try to grow up and be something. So, uh that's how I joined the Navy, but I joined the Navy because I wanted to be a Navy frogman. That is that is great. Now, something I want to add for our students today, both online and here, that the choice that Mike had is no longer a choice because these days it's we don't draft and we have an all-volunteer military in all branches, which means they can pick you. And if you're in that kind of trouble, they probably don't want you. So behave yourselves. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that also might be one of the most difficult ways to learn to scuba dive. Uh, no, I was already a diver. Were you so already yeah, a diver? Yeah, yeah, so I was already okay, so how old were you when you went into the service? Well, I actually, when I, when I joined, I was 17. When I went in, I was 18. I went on what they call the 120-day program. And uh, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And uh, uh, so it's, uh, you know, and the thing is, there's obstacles in front of all of us as we get older in life. It's not how you know how many times you get knocked down, because fell in at some is how fast you can get back up and do something about it. Okay, um, Finn, you have a question for Mr. Thornton. What inspired you to be a Navy SEAL? At the time I joined, it was called Underwater Demolition Recruit Training, and I didn't even know what SEAL Team was. So we were actually going through UDT training, UDT being the old Navy frogmen, and I joined the Navy because I saw that movie in Korea about Richard Whitmar. Of course, they were very famous, the frogmen. And uh, so when I went through training, we started off with 129 students in my class, and we graduated with basically 12. We had four, actually we had 16 graduates. We had four that was rolled back because they weren't very comfortable in the water. But they, they all four of those guys later made it through training in the next class. 
So uh, when they said uh, they took the top 10 percent because this is when Vietnam was very hot and heavy. And they said, Mike, you'll be a Navy SEAL. And I didn't even know what SEALs were. I said, I want to be a Navy frogman. And then, then of course, we went to SEAL team. Then we found out what SEAL team was. Um, Luke, you have a related question? Yeah, real loud. When you join the Navy SEALs, what was the hardest part of training? It all was hard, Luke. Uh, it, it was very, uh, they, they take you, and no matter how what great shape you're in, I was a, a, a unbelievable swimmer, actually, and uh, and I was a good runner, but I my swimming capabilities were a lot higher than my running capabilities. But they take your body, and they tear you down, then they rebuild your body how they want you to do. Uh, Guys that make it through training or, or wrestlers or, you know, team team guys that work together, soccer players, football players. But no matter how big and strong you think you are, you know, they go tear that down and they go rebuild it for what, how they want you to, to react. So it's all hard and it's constant. It's constant. They, you know, they give you a goal that you, after so many weeks, you reach this goal. After so many weeks, you reach this goal. And if you don't pass those goals, You'll get rolled back if they think you're worth having. If they don't, they put you up back in the military. Uh, Evan, you have a question? How did it feel to be chosen to be a SEAL out of your class of 129? Uh, well, like I said, we only 12 of us made it through training. So I have a class of 100. It was, like I said, I didn't know what SEAL team was, but when I got into SEAL team and found out what it's all about, it was a great honor. Uh, SEAL team can do a UDT job, but UDT can't do the SEALs job. And I'll explain a little bit more about the history as we go through this right now about why we only had SEAL teams now and no more UDT jobs. So, uh, but it was a great honor. It was a great part of my life. I learned a lot from being a Navy SEAL. Okay. Um, the crew, you want to take us on into the question of once Mike became a, a SEAL? <laughs> The question was, how did you feel once you actually became a SEAL? Uh, it, I, I loved it. I loved, I wanted to be a SEAL. It, uh, I, I went to Vietnam many times and then I also went into Thailand during the Vietnam conflict. Um, uh, I didn't go to war for battles or for accolades or medals. I went there because I was a part of the team. I was part of going together. And what I was most, the, my greatest thing was, is that the, the medals, which I'm very highly decorated, of course, and stuff, but it's the people I worked with wanted to go to battle with Mike Thornton. They wanted to be with Mike because I always brought my people back alive. And that was my greatest thing. It's, it's about a teamwork. It's, about, you're, you're, it's not about I, it's about we, and that you would risk your life for somebody else's life, and they would risk their life for your life. So that's when I was telling the, the last class in here, you know, so it's about a shim, uh, friendship, a camaraderie and, and, and all this. So that's what it's being a team because it's part of a family, a great family. Uh, we were talking a little bit before this webinar started about that. And I would like to think I know this class is well prepared and most of those teachers that are online probably have taught their classes about the Medal of Honor. But in case you're joining us fresh uh, and need some knowledge, the most Medal of Honor citations start with the words for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. And I think that that's really central to what you're talking about. Yeah. And almost all the citations include not some are, are pretty purely offensive actions, but most of them include a defensive action that includes saving one or more of one's fellow service people. So um, <clears throat> moving on into the discussion of the war, Audrey has a question for you. Audrey? What was going through your head when you were fighting? That's a big question. What was going through your head while you were fighting the enemy? Uh, what was going through my head? You, you don't really concentrate. You know, you, you, you're staying focused on the enemy because the enemy is trying to, you know, you don't get down. You stay positive. Every time I eliminate somebody, I didn't, you know, it, it's not a good thing because I knew I was eliminating somebody, but I, I felt I was keeping my guys alive. And I had already, during the first part of that battle, the battle went on for uh, two hours and 52 minutes. 
and it was basically four of us. Actually, there's five of us, but only four of us was actually in the fight. I guess odds over 75, then it got to be hundreds of people. And uh, so you stay focused on trying to keep everybody alive. And also stay focused on where your people are all the time. So you don't worry about dying because if you sit there and say, oh, I, I'm going to die, you're not focused on nothing because then they go overrun you and take your position. So you stay focused on what's go, what what your your greatest concern is, and that was keeping myself alive and all my other people alive. So um, Mike has a book. Pardon me for putting this in front of our faces for a second here. This is the book by Honor Bound, and it tells in great detail the story, far more than a Medal of Honor citation. A Medal of Honor citation is just a summary of the action. And I highly recommend this book, and I think it's appropriate judgment from a teacher's perspective, certainly for high school, high school reading, and probably for those of you who are pretty advanced readers at the middle school level. It's good history of that part of the Vietnam War, but it's also great biography and insight into the character of Mike Thornton and um, his lieutenant, Tommy Norris. Um, to go just a little bit on about that, my citation, when it went in front of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and then went to the White House, because it was at the end of the war, is during my fourth tour, and it went from 18 pages to one, like four paragraphs. So they wanted to take out all the stuff out of the citation, which Jim knows about this, because, you know, Vietnam was in a very highly uh, supportive, popular, popular uh, as they call it, it was a police action. I still haven't understood that. But, uh, but you know, the, the thing is, it's not like I say, I didn't go over there. I went over there to bring my people back alive. It wasn't about medals. It wasn't about accolades. But this book tells about 50 years of friendship of each other that Tommy and I still display today as brothers. And uh, my brother one day said, I think you love Tommy more than you do me. I said, no, the love is there. I just live things with Tommy that I've never lived with you. I'll remember that but the book is a great it's a great reading if you want to know a lot about training as you were asked in SEAL team why I joined the Navy and it answers all these questions that you guys are asking all right um Vaughn you have some a couple of questions from Mike uh, what was going through your head while you were swimming while you were giving those well I just was glad that I was swimming Tommy and Tommy wasn't swimming me uh uh but Tommy wouldn't have given up on me. He'd have dragged me off the beach. He'd have got me in the water. Uh, uh, you, you don't, you stay compass. My first thing is get us out to sea. So if you read the citation, it says I inflated Tommy's life jacket. I never inflated Tommy's life jacket because we had six lines of waves to get in coming in. So I took Tommy and used it like a surfboard, push him underneath the wave, come up on the other side and put his, my arms underneath him and I'd breaststroke then I'd take him one I say another I'd duck him underneath the wave that well Tommy had been shot through the left temple and his whole front lobal part of his brain was gone and his eye was gone and he was really badly injured and when I got him out past the range of the weapons that were shooting at us because when I was swimming Tommy out you could see the bullets flowing through the water and I said God don't let them hit me now because if they had to hit me I knew that Tommy and I were both of us sunk to the bottom of the ocean but I looked off to my south of me, and I could see Dane, and he had been wounded twice in front of me, but I couldn't see Quan. And Quan had been shot through his right buttocks and as part of his femur mu muscle. I swam over and got him and put uh, Tommy on my back and put Quan in front of me and put my arms. I swam with Tommy and Quan for approximately uh, uh, three hours until we were finally picked up off the coast of North Vietnam. Uh, uh, everybody said, you think, you don't think, you stay focused on what, as I said before, getting us from point A to point B. At this time, I was also focused on Tommy because Tommy had gone into deep shock and, and with that head wound. So all four of us were injured. You know, I had been hit six shrapnel wounds and shot through my left calf. So, uh, so but you stay focused on moving south and Quan and them said, why are we going south? I said, that's where the friendly lines are. So you stay focused on the motion. You keep swimming. You never stop. You keep swimming because you can, as long as you're going with the current, if you go against the current, it's going to push you backwards. Back. So you always stay focused what's out there. You keep changing your, what you need to be thinking inside of your brain all the time.
Abby, you have a question for, for Mike. At any point, did you think about giving up? No. You never give up. You never quit. That's something I'll tell all of you later on in life. That you never give up. And mostly giving up, you know, we all have barriers. We all have, uh, you know, things in our lifetime. And uh, But you never quit and you never give up. And when you get through that obstacle, you move to your next obstacle because you'll have many, many obstacles in your life. But you need to keep, you have to get through that obstacle. Only one person can stop you from getting through that obstacle. That's yourself. You, 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 you. So before we went on the air, we got a question from a student uh, online that about what skills did you have to learn to remain resilient? So in order to have this attitude of never giving up, did you do you feel like you had those skills before you were in the service? Yeah, I, my father only had a sixth grade education and uh, my father, our family was unbelievable and we were born in the hills of South Carolina and uh, my dad started his own company and, and he treated everybody. Daddy said, you take care of your people or your people will take care of you. And I learned that at a young age. But my father, he didn't know how to say I love you. My mother gave us those qualities, love and faith and God, you know, and daddy gave us, you know, respect of people, respect of human beings, respect of whoever you were, then you put everybody above you. So you are a service or servant of the people around you. If you love that person, you will give the utmost to make their lives better. And that's why my father was. And he's, oh, he always cared about everybody. Great question. Great answer. Thank you. Um, Ashton, you have a, a question? Uh, yes. When you were swimming, were you ever scared of what was lurking beneath the ocean? <laughs> that's the question last all the time. And I kind of laugh. You know, uh, you know, I've been diving all my life, well, since I was 16 years old and I've dove in every, you know, and I've, I've seen sharks underneath the water and I've seen I, I, orcas and I've actually dove with orcas up on Columbia Glacier up in Alaska and stuff. But, you know, I, I laughed at the guys. They said, well, what would happen if the coast, of course, there's blood. And you know, what would have happened? I said, well, I had two pieces of chum meat. I'd have given them Quan first and I'd have given them Tommy. And they would have been full by that time. So uh, you don't ever worry. Yes, it goes back again. You don't worry about you out of your control. You know, you worry what's in your control. So there's no use worrying about the things that you can't control. Of. So if a shark would have come up. I'd have dealt with that at that period of time, but I don't, I don't think in my mind, oh my God, there, there's sharks out here and we got blood in the water, you know, just keep focused on what what is going to keep us alive. It strikes me that you had more immediate <laughs> threats than sharks while oh, you yeah, were doing yeah, that. Yeah, well, but, I don't I know about you guys, but I would have been more worried about <laughs> drowning than I would have about a shark at that point. Um, Anna, you have a related question to that. What was your scariest moment in Vietnam and did you ever think I'm going to die here? So for those online, the question was, what was your scariest moment in Vietnam? And did you ever think I'm going to die here? I, I, I think you can't worry about everybody thinks about it in the back of their mind, but you can't stay focused on that because when you're worried about dying, you're not focused on the enemy that's going to kill you. So you got to stay focused on the issue that's in front of you. You stay focused on the enemy. Or it's like I just said, a while ago, you stay focused on what you control. Well, if somebody shoots me out of a tree, I have no control over that, do I? So you don't worry about it, but I stay focused on what's in the trees, and maybe I'll get him first before he gets me. So if you're out there scared to death, and that's anywhere, be aware of the situation. And all you young ladies and even you young men, just stay in time. Always be watching. There's so many things you can use when you're walking down the street. Use the windows, and you can see if somebody's following you. Just be aware of the situation. It's something good that you can learn stuff. So always be looking around. Don't be on those headphones all the time or texting because you don't know what's getting behind you and grabbing you, all right? So always stay focused on your surroundings about you all the time. So I know I never worried about dying. I don't worry about dying now. Why I'm still alive, I don't understand that. But what I do know is stay focused on the issue around you. So just think about you when you're walking to college or even here in the schools and you're walking down the streets. Stay focused on your surroundings because somebody might just drive up and grab you then we got a really big problem. You mentioned earlier that when you were in the the firefight that you had the there were the five of you, but one wasn't really engaged in the battle. And do you think that was a situation that would answer this question of you know what happens if you get scared? Was that what happened with Thing? Yeah, uh, uh, with Ty, uh, I with Ty, uh, 
I had never operated with him. The other two Vietnamese I'd worked with on previous tours of Vietnam, I handpicked them for this operation because the only person who knew about what the operation was was Tommy Norris and myself. I didn't, nobody else knew about it, not even our boat captains, not even anyone else. And then we, they, they, we didn't brief them until we got out to sea where nobody could see where our boats were. And then Ty was uh, by another SEAL officer at work with Ty. He said he had been on eight combat operations. Well, came to find out. He'd been on eight combat operation, but never had been in a firefight. So you never know how you go react when you get in a firefight. And that was just a bad time for him to be in a firefight because we thought he had been in firefights. And, of course, he panicked. And uh, it doesn't make him a good person or a bad person. I was pretty angry at him, very angry at him at the time. But after I found out his problems, he should have never been there. And, and he was, he's a great person. And, and let, let you know, I helped support him to get back to America. And he taught a community college for 22 years in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So he became a credit to what he believed in. But it, that's the reason you have to know your enemy and also have to know who's fighting with you at all times. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought it, thought it was interesting that, that, you know, the question that came up and you had four examples of what happened when you, when you concentrated and stayed on the task and one example of somebody who was, let their fear overrun them and took them out of the, out of the situation. So, um, Jake, you have a question, a little lighter one that we could address. Oh, yes. What did you eat when you were in Vietnam? What did you eat when you were in Vietnam? Whatever the Vietnamese ate, I ate. I worked mostly with indigenous personnel, the LDNNs or the Kit Carson Scouts. And whatever you eat is what, you know, when you sweat, you can actually smell. I used to tell my guys, you don't take baths and showers. You don't wash your clothes. You don't, you know, do this because that odor goes throughout the jungle. A lot of people didn't know that. And so when you sweat, you want to make sure you're eating. If they're uh, having, uh, you know, they did a lot of stuff. They'd set up fish and they drip it and it will be like a sauce, but it was very salty. But when you sweat your skin, the pores that comes out of your pores, you could actually smell it. So you want to smell as the Vietnamese. I, I used to go barefooted because all my guys went barefooted. I bought them boots and gave them the boots. They take their boots. And we go on an operation there, take the boots off and leave them in the boat, then they all go barefooted. Well, if I wore boots, everybody said, well, there's an American with them. So I went barefooted too. So you want to be part of the group, basically. Uh, so I ate whatever they ate. Every once in a while, when I forget a Saigon or Bentoy, you know, I'd have a big steak or a lobster tail or something <laughs> like that. But before I go back, I'd start eating the Vietnamese food. And it was all good. I mean, I, I the food was good over Okay. Interesting, interesting question. Um, Dennis, you have another interesting question. How many places did you go in Vietnam during the war? I had uh, uh, many different places. We traveled a lot. I started off in a place called Bin Lok, and then I went up a place near what they call the Three Sisters, right on the Cambodian border, where the Mekong Delta goes all the way into Cambodia. Then farther on up into uh, the Laos, I was a uh, place called Dung Island, the mouth of uh, Dung Island was at the mouth of the Ba Sok near Sok Train. And I had the Vietnamese uh, Navy SEALs down there that we worked in, also a platoon. Then I went to uh, down way down south at the very tip of Vietnam. And back then uh, we had a place called Sea Float, and it was a bunch of barges, and we had barges for helicopters and stuff. And I was there. Then I came back up north and then. Uh, other tours, I was up in, uh, uh, we started moving up to Da Nang and then a place called Tuyon. Tuyon was northeast of Way City. So if you know your history, Way City was overtaken almost during Tet of 68. And then another place called Mito, it was on, we always kind of wor worked off the rivers or the ocean because being a SEAL, SEAL stands for sea, air, and land. And at the time, Admiral Zumwalt was in charge of all the seals, so you had to be five miles inland or five miles. Well, Admiral Zumwalt, this is back in the late 60s, said, well, that river starts in the ocean. And it goes all the way to Cambodia, so you go five miles out to the river, so it gives us 10 miles. It was his brilliance that was able to make seal team what we are today. Good leadership. Good leadership. Okay. Um I have a question that came in online from Hope Ranch in Florida, and there's a couple ways to to read this question. The question was, did you get sick from the war? And I'm not sure if the question 
is, did you get sick of the war or did you actually become physically ill either during the war or since the war because of, of war related circumstances? Uh, did I have dysentery over? Yeah, yeah. I dropped from 220 pounds down to like 178 pounds, but Whew. that's just a bad juju in your body. And, uh, you know, you just try to deal with it over there. Uh, did I get sick of the war? Uh, not really. Uh, was I, uh, I never, even every time I was wounded, I didn't worry about it because that's, that's part of war. It's, uh, how do you defeat? Did I go back after I'd been wounded before? Yes, I did. I went back several times because it goes back to what I told you about is about me take care of my people and my people respected me enough that they wanted to go to war with my thorn. Uh, uh, do I have problems after the war? I've had one bad dream. Uh, that was in 1969. Uh, Tommy still has dreams. Everybody handles their demons in a certain different mm -hmm. way. What hap works for me doesn't work for Tommy. We all have demons, believe it or not. not. Everybody in this room has some type of demon, but you have to learn how to deal with it. You have to deal with it, but there's help people out there to help you deal with it. It's like they call it PTSD. I call it PTS. Everybody, you may let it become a demon if you let it become a demon. There's people out there who will give you all the help in the world, but you got to um, try to understand that help. And you have to take that and put it in that little brain of mine, which I am a K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. So if I keep it simple enough for me to understand, it should be simple enough for everybody else to understand. So we all have, you know, even today in schools and high schools, we all have those things, but you have to learn how to deal with it that makes it right for you. Okay. Thank you. Good, good question. Um, let's go back to the classroom here. Carolyn, Was uh, you have a question for Mr. Thornton? Um, was it hard to swim that long? Was it no, hard to swim no, that long? No, no. I, I've swam over 20-something miles. We used to swim from uh, Puerto Rico to Viegas Island. That's 15 miles every Wednesday. We used to, when, I was, when we would go down there to train and stuff like that. But we always had four mile time runs, uh, swims and runs, and we swam once a week, no matter if the water was 32 degrees or no matter if the water was, you know, on the East Coast or the West Coast. The water is always cold in California for anybody that gets out there. So, uh, it is. Now. What was the water like in, in Vietnam compared to the water in California? Vietnam was very, very warm. It was, at that period of time, it was warm. Uh, and also, it's very clean up there. It doesn't have. What it uh, does, I mean, it wasn't like going to Italy or even uh, China or uh, India where all the stuff they just been used as for a sewer for 3,000 years, you know. Uh, but it was very clean, uh, very, and they think that's what saved Tommy's life because that salt water was very salty and it worked like a saline solution. And he kept wash, washing out his wound and washing out his wound. And the reason he didn't go into really deep, deep shock, I had him up on my back so the sun, this was like three and four o'clock in the afternoon, so the sun was beating down on them. They think that's what probably kept them alive. I think a lot of people, if you're not used to being in the ocean a lot, you may not know that hypothermia, you don't have to be in cold water to get hypothermia because any water that is below your natural body temperature is going to lower your core temperature. And you guys were in the water for, what, three hours? Three hours. But the, the, the water was quite warm. Now, the coldest I've ever been in my life was in Vietnam, and it was only... 80, 88, 86 degrees, but I'd been wet for five days and you couldn't start fires or nothing. And after five days, it starts setting in. And as, as Kathy says, it starts going down. Now I've swam in ice water before. I swam from uh, Alcatraz to uh, the, the uh, boathouse in San Francisco. God, that's a tough swim. And, yeah, and it was in a pair of Speedos, but I was out in plenty of time. But I mean, it's but that water is cold there all the time, as Kathy just said, you know. So it basically is you just got to stay focused, just keep moving and stuff like that. But they feel that's what really saved Tommy's life was the clean, the purity of the water. And I know we, but America's better in any other country. I mean, you look at all the emissions and stuff like that. China, India, and Russia are the biggest in the world. But we're blaming everything on America. So we need the, everybody has to be accountable for what they do. I'm going to lighten it up for a minute here with a uh, question that came in online. Somebody wants to know if you what's your most humorous memory of your 
beds training of your seal training that that's appropriate for the audience ah uh, we should. <laughs> Uh, we tried to get cheat one time during Hell Week, and we got caught. And we paid, we paid the Pied Piper. I promise you, say that. And uh, we thought we were being so smart, and we called up this young lady. Of course, there's a bunch of young Navy frogmen out there, and her father owned a uh, tomato farm, and she had a flat bed. And we said we will get our rubber boots instead of paddling all the way. We're going to stack our pair of boots, and we get underneath our boots. Well, she's driving down uh, down the strand, and there's only one way in and one way out. And we, man, why we really pulled it on? We were gonna put it in near the base and paddle in like we really did something. And uh, we, we turned back, and there's our two of our instructors, Doc Klein and and uh, uh, Dick Allen and Vince Law there. And they looked at us, and I tell you, oh, we we hurt, we hurt. We never got warm for about three days, but we hurt big time, and. Uh, you know, of course, we're supposed to be that. But it's like Vince always says, you can cheat, but just don't ever get caught. Well, when you get caught, you go pay the pipe back. And it was funny. After after that, we talk about it 50 years later. We laugh about it and talk about it and say, boy, what, what, what went through your mind during that period of time? <laughs> okay. Ellie, you have a question for Mike. How old were you when you received the Medal of Honor? Okay, uh, I'm, let me let me just throw this out here. How old were you when you did your Medal of Honor action, and then how old were you when you actually received the Medal of Honor? I was 22 when I did my action during my fourth tour, and uh, uh, I was 23 when I received my medal uh, from the President Nixon. I received my medal from President Nixon. Okay, so I have to say I am. It, as not a strong swimmer myself, even though I'm a Californian, uh, not a strong swimmer, I am so impressed by all this swimming and all these things that you've done. But somebody asked, have you ever jumped out of a plane? Many times. I have about approximately 2,000 free falls and about 320 static line. Static line is the one that you say walk, you know, shuffle to the door, you hit the thing, you jump out in the same deploys your chute, but I like free fall and I like deploying my chute myself. I have better control. And another thing I like about it, I'm the one that packs my chute. So, uh, but you can have a, the, the doing free falls. We used to, with the young guys, they'd be there on their 10th jump. They think they're the greatest bear chute. So we help them pack their chute. Well, we'd put beer cans in there and all that stuff. You think it'd do something, but when we put it on top, so when it, it, it would deploy or free fall, they look up there and all the stuff's falling out of the sky. Okay. Uh, but, but you know, we always had somebody close by. We knew it wasn't going to hurt them because we had it done to us too. But yeah, I, I, uh, jumping is, is, is something that you, and you, you, you enjoy, but as you get older, your bones get brittle, but we still have guys, uh, I mean, President Bush, that was a tandem jump. His feet never touched the ground, even though he was 90 years old when he did his <laughs> last jump. You know. uh, somebody online from Hope Ranch Academy wants to know if there are heroes from your childhood who made you ready for your war experience. No, uh, I can say my father was my greatest mentor, my dad. He never talked about the war until after I had been, in, uh, uh, been wounded 11 times and I was on my way back after my second tour. Uh, the, the thing about uh, the Purple Heart people don't know, if there's one action, like my last action, I was hit uh, seven times, but you only get one purple heart. You get it per the action. So no matter how many times you were wounded, you don't get, you know, even though I was six, six swap wounds and shot through my left calf, you only get one purple heart for the action. And my father said, I think you understood what war's about. And I said, Daddy, I understood the first time I was wounded uh, that, you know, it hurts. And, uh, but he, he finally talked to me a little bit about World War II. And, uh, Came to find out my father was left in the Philippines. He joined the Army in 1937. Uh, he went to the Philippines in 39. When MacArthur left, he left my father in the Philippines. And what he went through, you know, he was one of the original raiders. I don't know if you ever saw the movie with John Wayne about the American soldiers. Daddy was way up north, and he worked with the Filipino nationals, and he still loves it. He loved the Philippines to the day he died. It's quite a heritage to no. have that as an example. Um, Carolyn, you have another question for Mike? What was your medal of honor It was a lot better now than the, uh, we did. Uh, My question was, what was the Medal of Honor ceremony like? Okay. Uh, 
it, my father was more excited about me receiving the medal than I was. Uh, I knew about the medal. I knew if you look in the back, the one in the middle is the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard Medal of Honor. And the one to the left is the uh, Army, and the one to the right is the Air Force. And the, the one in the middle was commissioned by President Lincoln in 1861, and the one to the left was commissioned by Lincoln in 1862. And the one to the right was commissioned by President Eisenhower or the Air Force in uh, 1959. And, of course, the Air Force, but there was no Medal of Honor receivers in Korea. Bernie Fisher was our first Medal of Honor. But the ceremony itself, I mean, I got off the thing. It was great. It was, you know, it was exciting. Uh, I was able to have my mom and dad there, which that was good. And I was there. My brother was there. Uh, so it was my immediate family. Uh, but, uh, you know, I see it now. And Admiral Olson was our first four star. Admiral, he said, Mike, do you feel bad? Because he knew what things were like when I went to the Hall of Heroes. It was me, my mom, my dad, and this young second class which is an E5, came and he pulls a piece of masking tape off and said, congratulations, you're in the Hall of Fame. Now as we have admirals and generals and everybody else there. But that's what it was there. But I'm glad that America is treating our young men and women with what they deserve. And then I, I, I don't feel bad about it. You know, it, it is. I can't change the past, but I sure can make the damn future better. Excuse my language. For the future of men and women to serve this great nation of ours. Ellie, you have another question for Mike. Um, yes. How, how deep below sea level did you swim? How what? How deep, how deep below sea level? Uh, 360 feet. That was with gear, though. Oh, yes. That was the <laughs> proper gear. It was mixed gas. I think I had, uh, I had, because uh, uh, every atmosphere, people don't understand, every atmosphere is 33 feet. So every 33 feet, you have this different pressure. So if you go out with a full set of tanks, just to 120 feet is about is the deepest. Now, you can probably get down close to 180 feet on air, but you will hardly have any air in your tank. So you have to always let you need to get back up. So you use the nitrogen mix? It is, but no, you, you know, helium. Helium, okay. You do helium in uh, uh, sort of mixed gas. But it's uh, you when you get past 120 feet, you don't see a whole lot down there because it's so doggone dark. So you know, but diving's fun. It's relaxing. You see the coral, the fish. It's kind of like a, a different world down there. So I, I highly recommend everybody learn how to dive. I still dive today at 71 years old. Good, good question. Um, somebody wants to know if you had if you had time for your family while you were serving. Jim. Uh, sometime the the, the 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 probably the greatest thing I regret about. Being in the military is, is not being around, and my first wife and the mother of my two greatest things, my daughter, Gina, and my son, Mike. Uh, and 18 and a half years of marriage, I was gone 14 and a half years. So I, I never can get that time back. But we try to spend a lot of great quality time now. Uh, that's something I, uh, I very I regret very much because I miss and my son going to the wrestling championships and playing soccer, and I watch, miss my daughter from – you know, running a cross country track, and uh, uh, she was a gymnast too, and stuff like that. So I miss all that, and you can't get it back. I mean, picture doesn't tell the, the excitement. You know, you get in, get it in the mail. You know, three months later, and you, you you kind of feel bad about that that you weren't there to support them. But I'm there to support them now every way I possibly can. How long did you serve? Total. How long were you in the Navy? I, I I came back from Desert, the first Desert Shield Desert Storm, in 1991, and I had my annual physical. And they made me retire in 1992. I retired in 1992. So 26, 25, 26 years. About 25 years. A little bit over 25. It was That's a great life, though. Super. Somebody asked. I think it might have been somebody from this classroom, but I I don't have a name on it. Do, do you still know Tommy? Oh yeah. Tommy and I, that's what that book tells right there. After 50 years, we're still the best of friends. Uh, 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 Here's the that's picture. A, that's me kissing see Tommy. The picture. <laughs> if you ever look online, you'll see a, a big statue of me carrying Tommy. I just, if you go on, online, the UDT Seal Museum in uh, Fort Pierce, uh, there's a 18 foot statue. My wife said, I knew you were bigger in life, but I didn't know you were 18 feet tall, but it's me. <laughs> 
Karen, Tommy, I don't know so, but we, Tommy and I are together probably six times, seven times a year. Uh, I'll be going up. As, uh, I was just with him, and uh, a lot of us do with the Medal of Honor. And Tommy loves to talk to classes, and we like to talk together because I gave him a lot of crap, and he gives me a lot of crap. And then we <laughs> want to keep it, you know, for everybody. But uh, yeah, I know him, and I'll always be there with him, as he's always there with me too. Okay, um, Estelle, you have a question for Mike. Have you ever gone back to Vietnam? Have you ever gone back to Vietnam among those 90 countries you've been to? Yeah, I, uh, I'd i love to go back now. <laughs> the time I, they wouldn't let you go. To, you'd let you go to two places, Ho Chi Minh City, which is Saigon, or you'd go up north to the capital. And uh, I didn't want to go up north. Uh, they have a museum up there, which I'm, I'm not very happy. It's, it tells you something when you see pictures of John Kerry and uh, uh, nothing, uh, uh, Mrs. Fonda, but you know, how they were very supportive of what was going on, not of the Americans, but because they were they were actually doing a lot of demonstrations. So you have to, when you do a demonstration, think what you're doing. She said that she was young and she didn't understand. Well, you know, the people in the POW camps like Admiral Zumwalt, which was Mellon George Day, John McCain, and a bunch of other guys, you know, Leo Thornis, and uh, these guys, uh, they were punished every day because of her actions. And she went over and visited North Vietnam. And uh, so uh, so always, you know, you guys have so much at your hand now. I don't even know how to use one of these things. But, I mean, but you can, you know, the thing is, you know, don't take everybody's word. Just get online and look at the history. And let you, you're all brilliant in here. You're all a lot smarter than I am. I don't even have a high school education. So, but, you know, make aware, educate yourself on it. Don't take somebody's word, but bring it up. Say, I don't agree with that. And stand up for what you believe in, because you live in the greatest nation in the world. And you guys will be voting here pretty soon. So you got to understand who you're voting for. Just don't say, I'm voting for them because of this reason. We'll find out what they're voting for. You know, Freedom's not free. Freedom is written in blood, ladies and gentlemen. And a lot of people have given their lives for us to enjoy this classroom. So never forget that. Great, great advice. Thank you. Uh, yes, education doesn't come from repeating what somebody else tells you. It comes from knowing the public reasons for your private convictions. That's extremely important. Um, John, you have a question for Mike? Uh, what did you do after you received the Medal of Honor? I stayed in the military, John. Uh, I stayed that I would say I was 23 and I got out when I was almost 45. So it, it, it was a hard thing to wear the Medal of Honor all those years because there was a lot of people, believe it or not, because I had the Medal of Honor and I had ribbons down to here that were jealous of me, you know, uh, and, I mean, jealousy is a crazy thing. I, I don't know why you would be jealous, I, you know, but, uh, but they, they may have three. This guy, you know, I went through all the way through the enlisted ranks and I became an officer and, uh. I learned a lot about, you know, when I was in SEAL team, it was a different thing. But when I went to the other parts of the Navy, I learned a lot about leadership. I knew a lot about leadership before. <coughs> but, you know, these other guys I was working with, you know, they were all divers. They were all EOD guys. They were great, you know, very expert. But, you know, I, I learned also work with the other Navy guys. And uh, my, the ship I was on, uh, the USS uh Saginaw, and another one I was on the USS Edenton, which was a deep dive in naval uh, submarine rescue seal. But, you know, there was a difference in between the regular guy crew, as we were talking about now, and the diver guys were the EOD guys that worked for me. So, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's, I, we, a lot of us say it's, it's harder to wear it because they put you up here and they say, this is what you're supposed to be. Well, I've been Mike Thornton all my life, and I'll die as Mike Thornton. And I said, I'll never let that change me, you know, but this, I was always tr took care of my people. Even today, I take care of my people. And, uh, but it's a, it's a tough thing to, to tow behind you. And you'll hear that from a lot of guys. And a lot of guys have problems with it. So would you share with them a little bit about what you've been doing since you got out of the, of the military? Uh, since, you've, since, you've been pretty busy. You're still pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. I got out and I own several companies and I did very well, uh, made a lot of money, knock on wood. 
if you were married to my wife, you'd need to make a lot of money. <laughs> uh, nah, she's a, she's a really sweetheart. She's a wonderful uh, woman. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I can say you this. know this is going to no, be don't recorded. You let, no, don't you let her see this. Uh, uh, I I started doing work for foundations. I started my own foundation uh, eight years ago. I used to do stuff with uh, other foundations, uh, but. They were turning their foundations into a bank. I think if you raise money for a foundation, and Jimmy knows about it, and his sons know about it, uh, your dad knows about it. He's helped me with my foundation with Connie. And we give out 97 cents of every dollar raised. Uh, my wife and I gave out a, a half a million dollars worth of five, 10,000. And it's a hand up, 11,000, 4,000, all depends, but I write the check. I traveled 281 days last year. My wife traveled 244 days. And I have a, a lot of really great business people help support me because they know that I'm I'm a man of my word. When you die, you can't take money with you. I I just buried two guys I have known for, uh, I've known Ross Perot since 1977. I know Mr. Pickens. And then within three months, I buried them both. Uh, so, uh, and they believed in my foundation. They both were supporters of my foundation. So is the foundation specifically to support SEALs and no, SEAL no, families no, or is it, it veterans it, in general? Veterans. Uh, we just, we just, uh, last, uh, last November, uh, no, last December, it was the 5th of December of last year. Uh, a guy, I got a phone call from the Marine Corps law enforcement foundation, uh, said I had an old guy, World War II, 97 years old, lived in Sacramento mission. I had their first snow and he didn't have his furnace went out. He couldn't afford it. He didn't know who to call him. So a friend of mine in Philadelphia contacted me. He said, Mike, I said, give me the number. I called and uh, I talked to him. He says, well, we don't have the money. So I called Connie, my executive vice president. I t said, call this guy, get his DD-214. Within 24 hours, I had him a brand new furnace in his house. And it didn't cost him a cent. I paid my, my foundation paid for it. But the sad part is two days before my, actually a day on the 22nd of March of this year, I get an email and a phone call. And he said, Mr. Thornton, 97 years old, World War II, he says, I don't know why I deserve this furniture, I mean, furnace, but I said, well, it calls you everything, but I just want to let you know my wife passed away and I buried her yesterday, but she died warm. Now, if that doesn't tear you up. But I give to all veterans. A lot of the foundations now, they give to the war on terror, which... That's okay with me too, but I give to all veterans. So it's given back. It's just like I say, it's not, it's my whole thing is my father said, take care of your people, your, your people. Well, my I've taken care of my family, but I love the military. And I see a lot of these young kids, they, you know, you get, you get retired out of the military. It takes you two years to get into the VA system. Well, another reason I started this foundation eight years ago, because we had a young Marine was having this massive headaches. And we didn't need, and they said, the VA said, we can't look at it. Well, he, he didn't have $5,000. I wrote a check for $5,000 to the doctor and to the MRI thing, found out he had a, he had a aneurysm in his brain. And then I got the VA to get thing and we did a coral system and we saved the young man's life. He's only 28 years old, you know? So that's when five years, eight years ago is when I really got involved and Connie got on board with me and my wife and I have a, Another Medal of Honor recipient, Senator Bob Kerry, not John Kerry, Bob Kerry from Nebraska. He's a United States Senator and Governor. He's a Medal of Honor. Him and I are in SEAL Team 1 together. I have some really unbelievable business people, and I have a lot of friends as your grandfather and your dad and your uncles that help support me. And so, uh, you know, it's giving back, you know, it's giving back. It's not about me. And everybody says, why do you do it? And I said, if it's to be, it's up to me. And you always remember that if you want to do something in your life, only one person can ever stop you, and that's yourself. Let obstacles be there. Go under it, go around it, jump across it. But always keep setting those goals. And even though I'm 71 years old, I'm still setting goals for me to do to the day I die. So don't get don't get stopped right there with your goals and say, well, I, I, I set another goal and keep moving towards that goal. Great advice. Great advice. I hope you all are taking notes. Somebody uh, from offline asked if you have any regrets. None at all. The only thing I regret is about my children. Uh, I see uh, 
And it was 14 and years when you were deployed. Yeah, 14 and a half years I was deployed. Uh, but those are the only regrets. You know, everything happens for a reason. Uh, you know, we all make mistakes in life, your life. Let's say how, you get knocked down. How fast do you get back up? How, how fast do you want to do something about it? You know, and by failures, by getting knocked down, that's how you learn from and you move forward and get better and take that as a lesson in life. Life is nothing but a lot of lessons. And it's like Kathy was saying that she learns something every time she listens to one of us speak or talk. And her father was a great, uh, he, he was a mentor to me. Her dad is World War II and he was, he had his medal at Normandy and uh, he passed away a few years ago. And I, I looked up to her father and I still think about him all the time, even today, because he thought about us. So always like say, if it's to be, it's up to me. So just take that in line. You think you're having a bad week? Read that book. No, amen to that. <laughs> Absolutely. You're having a bad day. You read any Medal of Honor citation. And yeah. You'll see that. We have a, a couple of questions before we run out of time here. Um, it's come up a couple of times online, uh, but I think you've already answered it. What was your main task in Vietnam? I mean, you've said looking after your people, but were you sent over there with a particular job description? Well, well basically, uh, we were trying to, uh, of course, intelligence is what we did. And we uh, trying right. to gather intelligence, of course. And that's what we were doing on that operation up north. We were trying to do what we call a body snatch. And by getting a body snatch, we knew that it, the area that Kwabi had already been overran and they were trying to take over Quan Tree and, and they tried to take over Wigan. This was in the late 70s. And all the all the military had pulled out in September. The last big unit, it was Army, had pulled out. And uh, and all we had over there was Army Special Forces, Navy SEALs, and Marine Recon. And we we were training with the Vietnamese, the Arvins, which is the Army, Vietnamese Army, uh, the, the, the Vietnamese Royal Marines, and the Navy LDN SEALs. So we're trying to collect, uh, but we still had our air support uh, with the Navy, uh, the Air Force, uh, the B-52 bombers coming out of uh, Thompson Air Force Base. And, uh, and then the, out of Utapau because they were a big tar target in Thompson. Utapau was actually in Thailand. And uh, so we were trying to get get uh, get them pushed back of course to Quabiet, almost like it did in uh, uh, in Korea and cut off their uh, their logistics and try to sign a treaty to get our POWs back. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course it didn't work that way. But when they started pulling everybody out, uh, they felt like they, uh, the Vietnamese felt like we had left them behind, and uh, in '75 they overtook the country. And, and, but we had got our prisoners back in March of 1973. Okay, uh, we only have a few minutes left, but it, I think there's a question here that Jordy, you have a question that might take us clear to the end of the time period here. What other moments in your life besides the Medal of Honor will you never? So you can hear online, what other moments in your life besides being awarded the Medal of Honor will you never forget? You have a couple my, of favorite moments? Uh, yeah, uh, my two children being born. I was there for both of that. And uh, and I, right now, my wife and I just had another granddaughter born, and I just had another great-granddaughter born. So it's, uh, it's, it's all about family. Those are my greatest moments now. And seeing a face on somebody when we give them a check or we help them out, you know, it's, you can never change that moment. And, uh, and then we still care. America still cares because uh, it only takes one vote from my foundation. That's me. But everybody in my board trusts me and they know I'm going to do the right thing. So you were talking about the importance for these students of setting goals and continuing to work for those goals, even if they get knocked down. Um, do you have any particular goals that you're looking forward to as in the upcoming years here, things that you want to accomplish? I uh, yeah, keep my wife happy. Uh, if LSU plays Clemson, I will be pulling for LSU because happy wife, happy life. Uh, you'll all understand that one day. Uh, I to, to keep well, building my, uh, you know, spending time with our friends, mm -hmm. uh, of course, Tommy, you, and, and many other uh, Medal of Honor. It's a brotherhood. Uh, when I received my medal, the first Medal of Honor received that I met was a gentleman by General G Jimmy Doolittle. I don't know if many of you know who General Doolittle was, but he's the one that led the attack on Japan. And uh, uh, in World War II, when they said it could be done, he said, Mike, welcome to the greatest 
fraternity of men in the world ever, and it has turned in. But what the Medal of Honor has done for me is given me the chance to meet some of the greatest, greatest people in the world. I've had dinner with every president since Johnson. And I, you know, just the, the people I've met, the, I mean, the entrepreneurs, like I said, Ross Perot and T. Boone Pickens and, and people of faith, uh, you know, they've talked to me and stuff like that. And, and people like you, you know, you guys are the future of America, you know. Just don't forget that you're going to, you, know, you can do anything you want to in this great world of ours. But, you know, don't take it for granted because a lot of people have given the utmost. They've given their lives for you guys to enjoy this beautiful life. Mike, thank you for being here with us today, both with these students and with the students online. It's been such a privilege to sit and chat with you yet again, and I hope we'll get to do this again sometime. I'm going to turn it back over to the EdWeb team to um, – finish out and give the teachers some direction. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Mike, for your service and for sharing those stories with us today. I think we all got a lot of, out of it. And thank you, Kathy, and the Congressional Medal Honor of Society for making this possible. And of course, to Ms. Hallman's class and to all the educators and students who logged in today. Thank and you. we invite you to join our free community on edweb.net. We will post that link in the chat. You'll be able to watch past interviews when you join, earn CE certificates, and you'll be notified about upcoming interviews. And visit the Medal of Honor Character Development Program online. You can access lesson plans there, learn about other recipients, and a lot more. And that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. We will see you in 2020.